more in my series of how cable TV works for the non-professional. I'm not going to go into kind of depth that someone who's actually in the industry should be studying this material. They should be going a little bit deeper. I'm also going to be a little bit vaguer on some of the electronics that I'd have to go back if I was teaching such people because they may not have the electronics background that most of my uh, channel viewers will have. So these are for amateur people with amateur electronics background to get a brief surface view of how cable works. So this is a typical network. I mean, it's not typical, but it's something I drew out just to illustrate a point here. So say your signal source is up here, and you're going through an amp, and you're splitting off feeding some other amps. Well, maybe this is a convenient place for your power supply to be. So you've got a big power supply on a pole, and I'll include some photographs I shot of some power supplies out in the wild. Or it could be a power supply on the ground, usually they're on a pole. And this power supply has a number of functions in it. It's uh, got a ferro resonant transformer for normal use. So normally when it's running off of uh, AC power from the, you know, the power grid, it's uh, going to be putting out what's called a modified sine wave. And it's basically kind of a clipped off sine wave. I'm just going to draw that. Um, and the Fuel Resonant Transformer gives you sort of a little bit of regulation. So, so you have an AC wave, but it's actually kind of clipped. Like a square topped AC wave, so it's kind of in between a square wave and a sine wave. If I remember Fuel Resonant Transformers correctly. I'm sure I'll be corrected if I didn't. Anyway, the actual sine wave can shrink and raise a little bit within there and you, but the tops will still be you know cut off it, it's a way of giving you some regulation so if it was stressed out you know maybe they'd narrow down a little bit i don't know but you get a little bit of regulation from a ferroresonant transformer it's just a simple transformer some extra windings and such i won't go into the details you can look that up um so that's one thing about the, the uh, power supply. The modern power supplies today almost all are 90 volts. The old systems used to run 60, some still do. Typical power supply may be loaded with only 3 amps and up to 15 amps of current flow. And it varies with the kind of amplifiers you have in your system. You know, a typical amplifier might draw an amp and a half each for these big line amps. Oh, I should say you know, um, distribution amps. And then maybe you have little line amps coming off to feed smaller areas. Maybe a couple on the chain even. So you got all that kind of drawing on the system. All these numbers add up pretty quick. You add up all these little amps. And pretty soon you're over the max of what one power supply can handle. You don't really want to run 15 amps if you don't have to. You hardly ever run a power supply that hard. That's running right at the hairy limit of what the power supply can do. And you're just asking for failure. So you don't want to really run 15. There one's out there running that the one i know for a fact <laughs> all right so we have a symbol looks like a capacitor and that shows you the power limit of this area that's fed by this power supply so the signal's going on but here we are through another amplifier and another power inserter another power supply whole different power supply area feeding these amps and then here's another one branching off here's a whole nother power supply feeding these amps over here so power supply can only do so much so they got it every so often you have to have a power supply out in the field and when i show you the pictures you'll you'll recognize them you've seen them around town a pretty typical fixture in a modern city okay this lpi which i just drew the black square is not unlike the line splitters we have like two-way splitters on, on the line and three-way splitters and uh, directional couplers and power inserters, but they're all in a common housing. They all look the same. They're in a common metal housing. I don't have one to show you, but it's smaller than that line extender I showed you. Uh, and depending on the brand, you know, they, they can be different sizes and shapes, but they'll all look the same for one brand pretty much, except for the sticker on the front. 
and you'll have four ports on it. You know, you can bolt in the same pin connectors I showed you before. Typical, what's inside of a LPI line power inserter is basically a straight path for the RF, just a little capacitor. RF can go straight through it. And this is representative circuitry. It's a lot more complicated in real life. There's a lot more components. I'm, I've drawn this to a real simplified circuit. Okay, so you've got, a AC, you've got a signal circuit, which I drew in purple. And then you've got an AC circuit from the power supply. And uh, maybe another capacitor to ground out any kind of noise and keep noise from getting out. But then you're going through one of those big inductors you saw on some of these things. They're big horse inductors wrapped around a big iron core. No RF gets through these whatsoever. They're, it's almost like AC and DC. Um, the AC power at 60 hertz is so low compared to the RF, it behaves almost like DC. It goes right through these coils. Big horsey coils, it can go right through them. They're made really heavy so they can handle up to 15 amps. So there's heavy wire on heavy big coils. There's also going to be a crowbar circuit I was going to draw in. It might be hooked up to the, like the union of these coils. If the unit's equipped with a crowbar, which about most of the new ones are, as far as power inserters, almost all of them will have a crowbar circuit in them of some sort. It could be two FETs, it could be uh, Quadrex, um, or I should say a Triax. Yeah, it could be a number of different devices that they use, different brands. So, there's also fuses in these things. And this is again for power direction more than actual fuses. And they put shunts in a lot of these things, just like I was talking about the amps for the shunts versus fuses discussion. Same thing with these. A lot of times they come with shunts. Sometimes we put fuses in them. Different brands come with different stuff. There's uh, some brands are coming now with little ATC type fuses, you know, like automotive type fuses. Or even this mini type, I forget what they're called. Like ATC, but smaller, even half size. Mini ATC, I'm not sure what they call those. So the in and out of this, it really has no in and out either way. But I can remove this fuse. And now I'm only powering that direction. I'm not powering this direction. So if I've got power coming from a different power supply, I've got to isolate it from the different power supplies. The uh, This is a game we used to play in the old days when uh, amp areas were bigger and power interruptions were real frequent. I used to work in Westland. It was a nightmare. Sometimes techs would uh, repower areas. Power supplies down and you want to repower a little intermittent section, you know, a little middle section. We used to have longer cascades than we have now. And uh, so someone would power something up for a different power supply. It would be bucking power. Bucking power is, say I took out this little power break here, meaning I took the fuse put a fuse, in, install a fuse where a fuse was t purposely not on the input of this amp. Instead I put one in, same thing with this leg, I put a fuse in this leg and I put a fuse here so this is all connected in this one line. Um, well now I'm bucking power, potentially. So I've got this power supply so putting its 60 volts in, I've got this power supply so putting its 60 volts in, and unless there happen to be in phase, you know, 50-50 chance at best, could be some kind of odd phase too, but at yeah, best a 50-50 chance of being in phase or being completely out of phase. Out of phase, you're bucking power. One power supply is completely opposite the other one. They're just sucking all that power back and forth to the system. Um, that's not a good thing. That's a quick overload. What can happen, what used to happen in the old days, as I'm getting far afield here into story time now, I guess, um, is we'd have a guy who would be pretty cavalier about doing that, putting a fuse in, temporarily powering something off a different power supply, and then the, uh, the phase would change because at the power company sometimes when they re they'll repower a neighborhood from a different source. So the phase can change. All of a sudden you're bucking power where you weren't before, even though there's no power outage or nothing that we know that, that's happening, but the power company's changed phase on one of the... <laughs> and all of a sudden you're bucking where you weren't. All right, well... So that's the long and short of that. We've got multiple power, power supplies, power supply in each neighborhood. You can only go so far in a power supply. Every one of these actives draws a certain amount of power. you got to add them all up. You'll see that draw in your power supply. 
parts that puts out a modified uh, sine wave chopped off. You need a true RMS meter to ac accurately read it because of that modified sine wave shape. And then the splitters and uh, power inserters, LPIs are all in a housing about as big as my hand. Uh, and they're all pretty typical. They got these coils blocking the three terminals. So if this was a two-way splitter, it would have the same three coils. These would be the two splitter outputs and this would be the splitter input. You know, it would be a capacitor, it would be the splitter box, whatever. You'd still have a, a coil network like this, maybe minus that though, because you have to have the, uh, this would be now RF, and the splitter would be feeding it. Um, or even if another coil, if it was a four-way, I mean a three-way splitter, you'd have to have four coils. And each one's got fuses in them, just like this LPI does, so you can control from which terminals now I'm talking a uh, splitter now, which might have a input signal, I call this just in, and then out would be 3 dB down, 3.5 down, and both outputs would be negative 3.5 down, and there would be a splitter network here you know, on the RF side. So I'm drawing an RF circuit and I'm drawing a power circuit in red. Power is just a 60 hertz. It's, like I said, it might as well be DC as far as RF is, is concerned. Kind of almost acts like DC in these circuits. The power, the uh, frequency difference is so huge from 60 to the lowest frequency we use is 5 megahertz. Um, not even that really. Anywho, that's about it. Uh, a network of coils. Quite often there's a crowbar. There may or may not be a crowbar circuit in a splitter. Uh, LPIs almost always have an, a crowbar circuit. These modern ones do. That's really all the suppression we really have. Some amplifiers have crowbars installed too. Um, that varies with manufacturer. And crowbars are kind of a mixed blessing, especially in an amplifier because if you really take a big wump and you got a crowbar circuit, you get a real big burn when that thing absorbs all that power. I, I guess you're damaged either way. It's a matter of not spreading it, you know, taking up that power and taking the damage there and not spreading further in the network, I guess. But uh, what happens with cable, this, we don't get too many surges except when power lines drop on our lines and cut us in half, you know, high tension. 20 kilovolt line or whatever the heck you know drops on top of your power your cable line, uh, you're going to get some big surges and some big burns, and really no crowbar circuit's going to save it. <laughs> you're going to have damage. One interesting fact about the power supplies is they have a modem installed in power supplies nowadays that reports back the status of the power supply, whether it's on or off, um, batteries, what condition the batteries are in in most cases nowadays. There's also batteries in these power supplies, three or six batteries generally, there's other combinations, but generally three or six batteries, and that's to keep the power up, you know, when the uh, utility goes down, we get about two hours run time typically on a three battery system, you know, maybe double that on a six battery. It all depends on how heavily the power supply is loaded, if it's loaded at 15 amps, of course, it's going to be a lot shorter than if it's loaded at 3 amps. And I, those numbers are nothing just out of my head, too. Um, you know, you probably have power supply running with 1.5 amps somewhere, only powering up a node, maybe. But that's normal range. You wouldn't usually put a power supply, if, you know, under 3 amps. You'd feed it off some other power somewhere, somewhere else if it was less than that. Another thing I was going to point out, the way I drew this, is note that, say, this amplifier here, it's getting its power from its output port, not its input port. Its input power has no, input port has no power at all because there's power blocks there, which could just be, like I said, a pulled fuse. And, uh, you know, same here. This one's getting fed backwards. It may even be fed from, you know, way back. Back power this amp from a leg of a splitter, then back powering this amp. So just an example, power doesn't go the same way a signal goes necessarily. 
which can be pretty confusing for a tech trying to figure things out.